Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 189. We're getting closer to that magic 200 mark. I don't know why it's magic 200 mark, but we're getting close to it, whatever it is. Anyway, this week the questions are taken from guide 238 on the I-400 class of submarines and the follow-up video I did on USS Texas when she's 107 years old with the Battleship Texas Foundation. So let's get into questions, shall we? A nondescript bullet asks, if for whatever reason Britain and the USA went to war in the 1930s, who would have had the better navy? That is a question that is very, very much time dependent. Uh, for one thing, carrier aircraft at the beginning of the 1930s frankly aren't up to all that much. Sure, they can make something of a difference, but the at the beginning of the 1930s even dive bombers aren't really a thing in the middle of the 1930s then sure you've got dive bombers and torpedo bombers but still not exactly going to set the world on fire but by the end of the 1930s you are beginning to get to a point where carrier aircraft probably can make a massive difference in and of themselves and then you have to look at the carrier hull so at the beginning of the 1930s I think the Royal Navy probably overall has the advantage because whilst the US does have the biggest carriers in the forms of Lexington and Saratoga, the US only has four hulls. Um, Langley, if you can count it, Lexington, Saratoga and Ranger. The Royal Navy has Argus, Hermes, Glorious, Furious, Courageous and Eagle. <laughs> so... You know, granted, you can make some argument about maybe Argus isn't exactly the world's latest and greatest carrier, but in a simple matter of flight decks and therefore availability of carriers, the Royal Navy is going to probably come out on top, which means that as per, you know, what actually US doctrine for most of the 1930s, if a carrier is found, it's killed. Well, the Royal Navy can trade carriers one for one with the US and still come out two or three carriers ahead. So... The early to mid 1930s, probably Royal Navy advantage, but as time progresses, the Royal Navy only gets Arc Royal towards the end of the 30s, whereas the US gets both Yorktown and Enterprise. And whilst that only closes the hull number gap by one, they are, of course, Yorktown class carriers, which means there's a lot of aircraft on board them. So, and then you get to capital ships. Now, Again, it's a bit of an odd one because by in, in the early 1930s, you're seeing the tail end of some modernization programs from the late 20s going on. So both fleets have 15 capital ships apiece with some of their better ones modernized. And they're just in the process of getting rid of some stuff because of the London Naval Treaty like HMS Tiger. But you're not talking about the full modernizations. Now, oddly enough, as time goes on, as you get towards the end of the 1930s, the situation actually becomes significantly better for the Royal Navy. I mean, they already had a speed advantage broadly uh, over the US fleet. In fact, you know, the Revenge class are about the only things that are approximate, approximating the speed of the US battle line. The QEs, the Nelsons, the uh, Renowns, and of course Hood are all faster but as you get towards the end of the 1930s you have renown war spite queen elizabeth and valiant just about coming out of uh, dry dock having been fully modernized whereas none of the u.s original 15 are and neither side has a far true modern fast battleship in commission so whilst the carrier situation is has gotten slightly worse for the royal navy the battleship situation has actually gotten much better and of course they have King George V, etc., due to come online a little bit sooner than Washington and North Carolina. Cruisers, on the other hand, is a little bit of an odd one. I mean, you could probably make an argument that the county class are better than most of the early US heavy cruisers in everything bar firepower. However, the firepower advantage is fairly marginal, and we are still talking in the early 1930s about the counties as mostly as built, without the um, honestly not intended governor armor attachments that they'd get later on. 
as the situation goes on through the 1930s, the U.S. is still building um, some heavy cruisers, things like the New Orleans. Although the Royal Navy does have more light, modern light cruisers under construction during the 1930s. And we're talking about ships that are basically commissioned in the 1930s. There's a whole flight of ships from both sides coming in in 1940, but that's slightly outside the scope of the question. So you yeah, kind of call it a draw, really, on the cruiser thing. And destroyers, well, everyone's building destroyers. So it is, there's a lot of give and take um, overall, but I think a lot of it comes down to just exactly which year because the sliding scale of who has an advantage over who is going to be quite different almost on a yearly basis because you know as we said at the end of the 1930s the Royal Navy has a significant battle line advantage because of its modernized ships but if it was 1937-38 it would be at a disadvantage because all of those ships would or near enough all of them would be in dry dock being refitted and thus not available the US is going to therefore have more ships available because they don't have any of their battleships in modernization programs so yeah it's a it would be very very difficult to call um, without a specific year and possibly even a specific month Luis Nunez asks wouldn't the Japanese navy have been better off going for a rocket launching sub even in the early 1940s not really because what are they going to put on it an explosive warhead that's pretty much all they can do and um, well <laughs> As experiments with trying to launch V-1 and V-2 rockets, well, V-1 missiles, V-2 rockets, off of various naval vessels, including submarines, proved in the immediate aftermath of World War II, good luck hitting anything. I mean, okay, sure, the Japanese, if they'd had some kind of, I don't know, V-1 equivalent, probably would have been able to hit the continental United States, but only because they were aiming for it. And, I mean, yeah, if you're launching a V-1 from a submarine off the U.S. West Coast with the wind and the wave action, etc., I wouldn't even put safe money on hitting the state you were aiming at, let alone a city or a specific installation. And a submarine, even something the size of the I-400, it can't carry that many. So... You've basically got a pinpoint precision strike warload with um, the targeting ability of a drunk guy skiing down a mountain in the middle of a blizzard whilst holding an AK that's been buried in the mud since the first AK-47 came out of the factory. Um, <laughs> and in fact, I probably hit the target more often than you do. So yeah, no no to the rocket launching subs, I'm afraid. Um Mind you, this being the Japanese, maybe towards the end, they might have had manned rockets, at which point the accuracy equation flips all the way back on its head. But then at that point, you've just invented the rocket-powered kamikaze, which, surprisingly enough, the Japanese actually did. Um, so who knows? Towards the end, well, it would have been more effective than launching scout planes, but still, it's you need a awful lot of them to do much of any import against a target the size of the United States. The Suit asks, what are the pros and cons of having multiple services? Other than tradition and history, it seems that many services have a spread of abilities. Army air or river units, naval air, shore-based personnel, air force ground crews, marines in general, and then specialisms like engineering, communications, medicine, etc. replicated within each. Well, redundancy is definitely one of those things that is a weakness of having separate services because well, basically as you mentioned you're going to have you know the royal engineers in the army the royal navy's engineers and the royal air forces engineers comms doctors blah 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 but the flip side to that is that each of those specialisms is actually quite different even though they fall under the same broad category because you know army engineers are going to know a a fair bit about you know bridging rivers and blowing up pillboxes recovering tanks none of which is all that relevant to the royal air force if we're taking british armed forces as this example but equally knowing how to maintain an aircraft engine is probably rather irrelevant to the royal engineers in the army 
And whilst knowing how to maintain an aircraft engine might be useful if you're serving on a carrier in the Royal Navy or perhaps on a ship that's large enough to merit its own scout plane, it's a fairly niche bit of skill. Whereas, you know, knowing how to operate a massive steam turbine is something that only the Royal Navy really has any use for, the Army and the RAF being rather short of steam turbine powered aircraft and tanks. So there is actually a number of quite clear divisions but even in something like engineering and similarly you know again medicine is medicine there's a lot of fairly common ailments but equally the kind of major injuries you're likely to see in a navy versus an air force versus an army are again quite different um, communications probably one of the few things where you actually probably could have used quite a lot of a lot more cooperation than you usually get especially because well, as world war ii showed you could quite often run into scenarios where um, you're supposed to be talking to each other, whether that be the Army talking to the Navy, the Air Force talking to the Navy, or the Army and the Air Force trying to talk to each other, only to discover that everybody's using completely different types of radios with com operating on completely different frequencies and possibly even completely different encryptions. Now, having multiple encryptions not so bad because it makes it harder for the enemy to breach all your communications... But if you're, say, um, I don't know, a carrier force trying to conduct close air support for an army unit and you can't figure out who's friendly and who's enemy because they can't talk to you via radio and then you get jumped by a bunch of RAF Spitfires who also can't talk to you because they can't communicate via radio, that's not such a good thing. So that's definitely a, a bit of a, a con. Um, but... The, really the that's probably uh, that and the fact that obviously each service is then going to fight like cats in a bag for the slice of the budget each year possibly to the detriment of, of both themselves and the nation's defense as a whole those are the only two major cons of having separate services because otherwise you know everyone has very different priorities the the navy obviously ha has a priority in big ships the Air Force, their biggest, their physically biggest priority in terms of mobile um, assault hardware is going to be a strategic bomber, whereas the Army is going to be worried about things like tanks, which are all very different design paradigms. And even when it comes to aircraft, an uh, aircraft that's designed to operate off land and an aircraft that's designed to operate at sea are, again, two very, very different things. And, well, trying to combine even an element of two services when they gave the fleet air arm over to the RAF in the 20s and 30s didn't exactly work out too well, did it? Um, I think at one point Canada tried to go for a joint armed service without any Army-Navy air distinction, and then they went back to being separate services later on. So I guess that's a, a case study of why you don't do that. And you also have to consider manpower requirements and how much skill you need for each. Now, this isn't to say that army soldiers aren't skilled, but, you know, if you consider, let's say, consider the army's main heavy strike power, let's say it's a division or even a, an army or, or a corps, you know, you, you're talking about tens of thousands of men, each of which you have to train in survival, how to shoot guns, possibly operate artillery or tanks depending on if it's that kind of division or not but generally speaking the army outside of a few niche units is very manpower intensive but not massively technology intensive at least in world war one world war two i mean yeah sure tanks are complex machines but they're not they don't ca have hold a candle to some of the other stuff that the other services use in terms of overall complexity in fact if they were they'd keep breaking down <coughs> germany um now, if you consider, let's say, a fighter wing or a bomber wing, the Air Force, therefore, is relatively speaking not that manpower intensive, but does need a fairly high skill floor because, you know, if you can't fly, if you can't fly, you're never going to be put in a fighter. And if you can't fly well, you probably shouldn't be put in a fighter. I mean, you still have to fly well to pilot a bomber, but it is a slightly less uh, intensive task in some circumstances, I'm flying a fight. I mean, if you're being shot at by night fighters and, and flak emplacements, it's very high stress, but you're not going to be pulling off dogfights in a four-engine bomber most of the time, the way that a fighter pilot would. But anyway, the point is, you know, a fighter wing might need a few dozen pilots 
and then you've obviously got the ground crew, the maintenance crew, armorers, fitters, etc., etc. That expands the Bamhau footprint a reasonable amount. But the cutting edge, the stuff you actually are throwing into the combat itself, is a few dozen men for a fighter wing. And the navy sits kind of in the middle a little bit, in that you know the, the navy does for say a battleship or a carrier needs a thousand, maybe just over men. So slightly more than a fighter squadron or even a fighter wing, um, but also nowhere near the size of a division. And that the Navy battleship or carrier can take itself wherever you want to go. Whereas if you're moving a fighter wing or an army division across the, to the other side of the planet, you need to involve a lot of extra stuff to do that. And any one of those services, if incorporated into an overall single arm service, isn't really going to understand the limitations or advantages of any of the others. So there might be some very basic pluses in terms of, say, if an army division needs to be moved, if you're all part of the same service, you go, right, you're going to move on that ship instead of having to you know, phone up the Admiralty and say, oh, can we borrow a transport? But whether or not you even have that transport or the division in the first place is actually a fairly big question you might have if you have a single joint service because what will probably I would imagine tend to happen is when you get a single joint service whichever one is the most strategically important to the nation at the time will probably tend to predominate and force all the others to the bottom even more so than they do when they're separate services. Deeks25 asks how do you rate the concept of the scout plane equipped submarines such as the I-400s, the short-lived HMS M2 etc.? In practical terms, I've always found the idea a logical one. A stealthy, long-range unit that can launch a scout aircraft with little warning to the enemy that can report on the enemy position. Even if the aircraft is shot down, if the sub's still able to report the plane's findings, it's still potentially a useful asset. And then one still has a submarine in the area with the ability to launch sudden surprise attacks. Yet the idea found limited implementation, which suggests that it's not a good concept. Is there a reason why? Is there a flaw in the core concept, or are there other factors? The biggest flaw is that an aircraft carrying submarine, especially by World War II standards, has to be very big. And that means it's going to be very expensive. That means you're not going to have too many of them. And it compromises some other things that are fairly important to a submarine, like fast diving, etc. And that makes it not a particularly brilliant attack platform. So you are effectively creating a monopurpose submarine. And whilst Jack of All Trades Master of None is very definitely a thing, almost all naval vessels need to have multiple possible uses. So your generic submarine can attack enemy warships, it can attack enemy merchant ships, it can conduct reconnaissance of an enemy's coast, and can act as a navigational marker for other ships, etc., etc. In obviously in contested areas where you might not want the enemy to know what you're doing. Whereas a big aircraft carrying submarine, and bear in mind, even something the size of M2 couldn't really carry that many aircraft. I-400 was a monster, and even then couldn't carry a tremendous number of aircraft. Are basically restricted to just doing that because one, they're a bit too clumsy for general attack purposes, and two. You probably don't want to use them for general attack purposes because then you might lose one of your very, very valuable aircraft carrying subs. The other, and then, you know, so not only have you created a monopurpose thing, but you've created a monopurpose thing that in most circumstances, another more general use vessel can actually do better. So, you know, typical cruiser can carry multiple aircraft, usually can end up carrying more aircraft than your submarine. It's faster to deploy. Admittedly, it's not stealthy, but it's much better armed. And because it's just that bit larger, it can also probably its aircraft can go further. So the only thing that a cruiser can't do compared to an aircraft carrying submarine when it comes to scouting is be stealthy. And in a pre-radar environment, and even in an early radar environment, even a cruiser can be pretty stealthy, just not quite as stealthy as a, as a submarine can. So there is only really one niche in which a air scout aircraft carrying submarine could excel, well, or could do a job that nobody else can really do, which would be 
reconnaissance of an enemy target that doesn't have a tremendous amount of defences, because if it does, well, a single scout plane will probably be shot down by either fighters or flak. But if they don't have particularly great defences or they're not expecting you, then you could scout that area if that area is out of range of your nation's own land-based regular recon aircraft. But that's a very narrow window of possible th places where you could do well. Because if, I say, if you're in range of your own land-based recon aircraft, we'll use those, they'll do a better job. And chances are most of your enemy's targets are going to be pretty well defended. So you're really looking at kind of the occasional scouting mission over a contested Pacific island, occasionally poking around some of the Australian ports, but not even all of those, which basically amounts to the Japanese Navy in <laughs> target profile, which is why some of their more regular cruiser submarines would carry the odd scout and occasionally pulled off something vaguely useful. Um, and in that case, you know, you could use it as a determination of should should I try and sneak my submarine into this port? Well, your scout aircraft can tell you if there are enemy ships worth going after in there. But that's really about it. Um, they're not numerous or large enough to do any meaningful attacking. And in a European context, they don't really make any sense because you can near enough as makes no difference get regular recon aircraft over almost anywhere that matters. So it's only in a very, very narrow, very specific niche in the Pacific, really, that an aircraft carrying submarine has any real utility. And it's probably not worth it, considering the relatively low rate of return you get compared to, you know, the resources expended. Kendra Malm asks, So many warships from various nations are named for cities or regions, states, counties, provinces, etc. Which pair of ships representing a particular city and region would you say have the most impressive resume? Uh, personally, I'd nominate my hometown USS Olympia and USS Washington the battleship i think it probably very much depends on how you're defining this because if you're defining you know collectively ships of this name then obviously the older european navies are going to have a quite a significant advantage because they obviously have been around longer so and they have adopted the practice sooner and then even within that, you have to look at the states that have been more stable over the past 500 years, or indeed in the case of places like Germany or Italy have existed um, for any significant period of time, considering both Italy and Germany came about in the 19th century and the state that we recognise them today. So you know, here, for example, is HMS London. HMS London has a list of battle honours going back 500 years. Obviously not all of them earned by this particular London, but there's been a fair number of Londons in all of the, in the Royal Navy's history. And as far as a town, city, or, or um, in our case, county name goes, London isn't even really the most remarkable of all the names that are, have been in Royal Navy service. So, uh, unfortunately, if you use the name as a like ships that have been named this, the Royal Navy has this huge ad built-in advantage of time. Um, whereas if you're looking at individual ships that happen to have a city re or region name and have a very impressive resume, then things get a lot more broad and open. At that point, yeah, you can point to something like Washington. That's a pretty good resume. Uh, but then you're also looking at ships that have a fairly long lifespan. Now, since a lot of city or region name ships, well, depending on the nation in question, but quite often you get cruisers carrying that kind of name, and they tend to last slightly less than the capital ships do. So obviously you've got, the, say, for example, the county class cruisers in the Royal Navy, or indeed the town class. Belfast's got a pretty good resume, actually, on that count. Um, and then, but then in the US, you look at something like the Brooklyn class, which in many respects, name-wise, could be the US town class. Um, but then they keep doing that with other, other, other cruiser types. So who knows? Uh, they are, they are what they are. But, you know, uh, 
not many of those last too long. Of course, uh, USS Phoenix ends up going off to be General Belgrana, so that's got quite a long resume. Uh, Malaya, you know, battleship, fought at Jutland, fought in a number of actions in World War II as well. Reasonably impressive resume for that. And then you go back into the Age of Sail, where you might find you know ships of the line that lasted 30, 40 years of active duty carrying city and region names, and they will obviously have racked up a lot of individual battles. Then, of course, you've got uh, ships like Minneapolis, New Orleans, uh, San Francisco and San Diego, all of which achieved quite a lot of battle stars. They're all in the top 10 for the US Navy, and obviously all named after regions. And then you also have ships like, say, HMS Norfolk, which managed to be in for attacking and fighting both Bismarck and Scharnhorst, as well as going after quite a number of other German ships. JK asks, Why wasn't King George V sent out with Prince of Wales and Hood? To my mind, it would have made much more sense to have the two new and heavier protected ships engage Bismarck and keep Hood as a backup to hunt down Prince Eugen in case she made a run for it. The reason that Tovey gave for keeping King George V and also the carrier victorious back was that at the time that Hood and Prince of Wales sailed, he didn't know for certain that Bismarck and Prince Eugen were heading for the Denmark Strait. It was likely, but it wasn't certain, and the Denmark Strait was the single furthest point of the three possible routes that Bismarck could have used to get into the Atlantic. And Tovey decided that he would rather stay back a little longer to let the intelligence picture develop. But by staying back, that would rule out an interception if Bismarck was going through the Denmark Strait. And so he had to send something to the Denmark Strait. And, you know, well, he had three three capital ships and a carrier at his disposal. And he decided to send Hood and Prince of Wales and keep Victorious, which, like Prince of Wales, was pretty new with himself and King George V until the intelligence picture was clearer. So if the intelligence picture had indeed been a little bit clearer and the, they knew 100% yes, Bismarck is going for Denmark Strait, I suspect at that point you would have seen King George V, Prince of Wales and Hood, along with Victorious, all pile north to engage. Now, I can see the logic to a certain degree, but it does mean that he's penny packeting his forces, which I don't think is necessarily a wise move, because let's say that his fears had been borne out. Let's say that Bismarck had, in fact, been going for one of the more southerly routes, and indeed King George V and Victorious were already at sea by the time Hood and Prince of Wales engaged at Bismarck. They were just obviously far too far away to do anything about it. Well, if Bismarck had gone by, let's say, the southernmost route, then it would have been King George V and Victorious engaging. So it would have been one battleship versus a battleship and a heavy cruiser, which isn't exactly brilliant odds. Yes, Victorious's aircraft would have tried to help even the fight, but you'd be gambling an awful lot on a brand new carrier crippling or destroying one or the other in order to make it something like an even fight. Um, because it's relatively unlikely that Hood and Prince of Wales would have been able to do a 180 once they're in Denmark Strait and get back quickly enough to meet up with King George V and Victorious had Bismarck been going via a more southern route. So... Whilst there is a certain amount of validity in having access to comms and intelligence, if it had been me, I would have probably gone more with my instincts and said, right, well, if I'm if I'm more than 50% certain that Bismarck is going via Denmark Strait, then actually I would take everything. So both King George V's plus Hood plus Victorious go for the kill you know, don't bother with anything, even approximating a fair fight. Just keep victorious with some escorts, maybe tagging a little bit further behind, maybe 50 to 100 miles behind. You can still keep in contact with it. It's got enough escorts um, to deal with any U-boats and such. Like, the aircraft don't really care about that distance. It's not going to make a huge difference to their ability to hit any targets you find or to do recon, um, especially when you've got Norfolk and Suffolk already up there. But what it will mean is that if if you've rolled your dice wrong and actually Bismarck's going south of Iceland, then Victorious, remember being a 
fleet carrier is faster than any of your capital ships and being slightly further back so probably be about three four hours sailing further back if you get word at the last minute actually Bismarck has come south then Victorious can do a quick 180 power south it's got the extended range because it's got the aircraft as well and then you launch Victorious's aircraft in the hope of slowing Bismarck down enough for your three capital ships to come pounding south a little bit behind them and finish it off that would be my estimation of what to do um obviously Tovi's estimation was different but I think it's probably knife edge enough that it pretty much comes down to how aggressive an admiral you are going to be now that's not to say Tovi was that was a bad admiral he wasn't um his handling of the final battle with Bismarck was pretty darn good but personally I do think he could have stood to be just a fraction more aggressive in that circumstance the mighty cornflake asks on what does carrier capacity depend and could for example the shikakus have been built with more space for more planes for world war ii at least carrier capacity depends on quite a number of things for one thing it's dependent on how big you're building your carrier in the first place you know, physical dimensional limits regardless of any other following factors then you've also got to take into account how your carrier is designed um, do you have an armoured flight deck or not? If you have an armoured flight deck, then because of the additional weight that you're going to end up with, especially if you go with an armoured box hanger the way that the British did, you're going to end up with a slightly smaller overall carrier for the same displacement, which, you know, physical size limits are a thing. Um, lower hangers, therefore you're not able to store quite as many aircraft in, or any if possible, um, in the upper part of your hangar the way that the Essex and Yorktowns could do um, are you going for a single hangar or a double hangar how long along the ship is are your hangar or hangars running um, so obviously double hangar theoretically has more hangar space uh, but um, if your hangar is truncated because it doesn't run the full length or near the full length of the ship then that's a limitation as opposed to a strength are you doing a deck park or not that makes a huge difference as well how many lifts have you got or aircraft elevators depending on which country you're in and how fast are they moving how many aircraft can they move because there's no point in having a double or triple hangar running the full length of the ship and having 120 aircraft aboard if you have you've only got two relatively slow lightweight elevators that can only bring you know two small aircraft up to the deck at a time over maybe of course of several minutes so if you are going to have lots and lots of aircraft stored below, make sure you've got the, the elevators to actually move them as well. And then it's also little tweaks, like so with the Shikakus, initially they thought Shikaku was going to have left-hand side island. Uh, she was eventually built with a right-hand side island, but they left a lot of the base structure in, and that did impede slightly on hangar space. So a revision to the Shikaku class, for example, would have been to actually spend the extra time and money to get rid of that now unnecessary structure that could have freed up space for a couple more aircraft maybe um, and as you can see with this picture of the shikakus the their hangars did not actually run full end to end uh, it occupied a substantial portion of the ship but not necessarily all of it so that potentially could have been another change to improve their overall aircraft carrying capacity but all of this does also obviously depend on how quickly you can launch these aircraft. So there's no point, again, in having 100, and 100 or 150 aircraft aboard if you can't actually get all of those aircraft in the air in a reasonable amount of time. You know, if the first aircraft you launch are coming back from the lack of fuel, having completed the mission before the last ones are up in the sky, you can make do with fewer aircraft. And this is actually a problem that the Essex class, especially the long hull Essexes and the Midways, encountered towards the end of world war ii where they were initially when aircraft were a little bit smaller capable of carrying far more aircraft than they could actually realistically operate which was a good thing long term because it meant when aircraft got larger they could continue to operate fairly large air groups well past a date when you might otherwise have thought but initially i mean initially it was also something of a good thing because it meant you could instead of operating all those aircraft you could carry lots of spares which was good for time on station um, but you could also have a bit more space around each aircraft which made for easier maintenance 
but it it still did mean you had a smaller air group than what you, your theoretical maximum was. Prussian Hill asks, I recently travelled down the North Carolina Outer Banks for a summer vacation, and I picked up some books on Outer Banks history. I was surprised to learn that the state of North Carolina operated a galley, the Caswell, during the American Revolution. I knew that galley light craft were used on Lake Ticonderoga in upstate New York, and I'm aware that galleys were used until relatively late in the Baltic and Mediterranean, but I wasn't aware that galleys were used in the Atlantic during the Revolution. Are there any other uses for galleys outside of the lakes, the Med and the Baltic during this period, aside from the Outer Banks? And how late were galleys used? How late were they militarily effective? Also, would you consider a video about the early US state navies that operated during the American Revolution? So there were a few other uses of galleys. The fundamental thing with galleys is that their their main strength is being able to operate either against or without the wind. But compared to, you know, late 18th century warships, they sacrificed a lot in order to do that, mainly in the terms of broadside firepower. So you had to have a fairly, fairly significant advantage to being operate to being able to operate contrary to the wind and probably also be relatively short range for a galley to have some effectiveness. Now, that might give you a clue as to where you might find them. Um, galleys of varying descriptions were still to a certain degree used by the various Barbary Coast pirates. They did have more conventional sailing vessels as well, but galleys they found at least for short range operations were very handy for going after merchant shipping because most if not all merchant shipping was just sail powered so on a windy day a galley could chase down a merchant ship and then when the wind died they could close the distance quite comfortably and capture it without the merchant vessel being able to do all that much and the fact that a galley usually wasn't as well armed as a conventional warship its size it didn't matter too much when you were going after merchant ships who also weren't armed very much for their size and tended to be relatively speaking small now the other place that you saw a lot of galley use around this period still was on the major rivers of europe um so we mentioned that was mentioned earlier the uh, frigates, quote unquote, of Prince Eugene or Eugenie or whatever, um, and of the Danube flotilla of the Austrian and Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now those continued in use, not the specific ships themselves, but the same kind of galley frigate popped up again and again during the 18th century on that and a couple of other major rivers. And it's fairly obvious why on a river, because you know the chances of the wind being available at sea are variable but at least at sea most of the time there's a direction to go in whereas on a river with a very definite direction to up and down it um, if the wind is blowing across the river it's not very useful for a sailing vessel but a galley that can just row up and down the river whenever the wind disagrees with it is a very very effective ship compared to something that is purely caught with sails. Sean Morrison asks, The Marine Nationale built up a rather sizable fleet prior to both world wars, but then appeared to have played relatively minor roles in said wars. Could you outline the Marine Nationale's operational contributions to World War I and World War II? Okay, well, the Marine Nationale in World War II is much easier to summarise because, of course, they were involved in the war for considerably less time, which was basically they helped initially in hunting trying to hunt down various german raiders so the force de rad or force de raid i'm not entirely sure how it's pronounced in french apologies to french listeners um that did a fairly good job in covering large portions of the southern atlantic and part of the indian ocean looking for the graf spey even if it was eventually found by uh, commander harwood's forces but um that was involving you know dunkirk strasbourg a bunch of other fast french ships then you also had some French participation in the Norwegian campaign, uh, general French particip participation in the convoys, and all and a reasonable amount of French ships were also deployed to the Mediterranean as it began to look increasingly more and more like Italy was going to get involved. And of course, then they did get involved. But Norway and the hunt for the Grash Bay were the two main big notable deployments of the Marine Nationale during World War II. And then, of course, 
the fall of France, the installation of Vichy France, and the navy split into a small number of ships that went off to become the Free French, and the Vichy French navy, which kind of mostly sat around not doing a tremendous amount. Whereas the Marine National in World War I actually played a fairly significant and often, as you said, underappreciated role in the First World War. Uh, because one of the agreements that the British had made with the French as part of the Triple Entente Alliance was that if you ended up with a major war with Germany, then in direct contradiction to almost 100 years of British policy previously, which had had the Mediterranean fleet as the, the prize posting for the Royal Navy, the French were going to look after the Mediterranean while the Royal Navy concentrated in the North Sea to deal with the Germans. So... At the start of the war, the Marine Nationale was mostly involved in uh, escorting troop convoys from French North Africa to continent, uh, continental France, to mainland France, in order to obviously bolster the French armies with, and supply the Western Front. Initially, they were also keeping an eye on the Italians, but then, of course, the Italians decided it was better off being on the Allies' side. And then it was the French and the Italians, for the most part, that kept the Austro-Hungarians bottled up in the Adriatic. And that involved a number of battles and a lot of patrolling, which ate up a lot of numbers. And then, of course, you also have the Dardanelles campaign, where there's a significant French presence and they lose a number of ships. So that's another big commitment for the Marine Nationale. But basically, the Marine Nationale is largely doing what it agreed to do in looking after the Mediterranean for the most part. There is a British element there, of course. Um, there's the Italian element there, but the bulk of the Marine Nationale is is all there. There's a few um, Marine Nationale units on the French Atlantic coast and in the Channel, and they're occasionally helping out with the Dover Patrol and such. And, of course, French colonial forces overseas, um, some of whom had the misfortune of running into Emden, for example. But those were very much kind of ancillary to the main marine national commitment which was which was the mediterranean itself of course as things developed they would redeploy ships so obviously lots of stuff at the dardanelles later when that's no longer a thing then more watching the adriatic and a little bit more free action to maneuver themselves in other places but of course for france especially the vast majority of the action is happening on land so by the end of the war, the French Navy, it's not that it doesn't have anything to do, but it has substantially less to do with the overall strategic outcome of the war circa 1918 um, than, say, the Royal Navy did. Dr. D. M. Platt asks, if the Royal Navy had humoured Vickers and selected their 14-inch gun instead of the 13.5, what effect would that have had on the arming of the Queen Elizabeths and subsequent classes or ships, and then at Jutland as well? In terms of an effect on the Battle of Jutland of using the 14 instead of the 13.5, I don't think you'd actually see a tremendous difference. It's half an inch. Yeah, sure, the shells are slightly bigger, they hit slightly harder, but mm, it, it's not going to make a massive difference, I don't think, in any particular way, shape or form. What it would potentially have changed, which could make a difference, as you mentioned, is the armament of the Queen Elizabeth and the Revenges and so forth, because 14 to 15 inch wouldn't be seen as enough of a step up. I rather suspect in that case, therefore, that the Queen Elizabeths and subsequent would probably have been armed with 16 inch weapons in pretty much the same layouts as we see them historically, just maybe with the ships being just that fraction bigger in order to accommodate the slightly larger ammunition and guns. And we can see everyone going, no, oh, but Drac, the, the the British only had 16-inch guns with the Nelsons in the 1920s. And yeah, maybe they were considering them for the G3s, but that's still not 1920s, maybe late 1910s, if at all possible. Um, well, those 16-inch guns, sure. But there were 16-inch guns available in Britain or much further back than that. Uh, for example, when the ship that would eventually become HMS Agincourt in its original form as the Rio de Janeiro was being designed in 1910, 1911, uh, early 1912, a number of options were considered and uh, that were drawn up by various British yards, which included a number of designs with 16-inch guns. Uh, something that would be a 
process would be repeated with the Rio Coelho um, a few years later. But Rio de Janeiro, as one of her original sketch designs showed, could have had 16-inch guns. And when you look at the advertising material for the time, Elzik, one of the big gun manufacturers in Britain, was in early 1913 openly advertising a 16-inch gun for sale to anyone who wanted to buy one. Now, obviously, 1913, early 1913 is a little bit late, considering that the um, Queen Elizabeths, the first two, were laid down in late 1912, and obviously the design had to be frozen at, l at the very latest earlier in the year, so about a year before that particular advert was put out. But the fact that Elswick was openly advertising this thing for sale in early 1913 and the fact that the British designers felt confident enough to offer a ship for build with 16-inch guns a couple of years before the design for the Queen Elizabeth was finalised indicates to me that Elswick probably had that 16-inch gun kicking around, or at least the design for it kicking around, a fair bit before March 1913. The only reason I can't say categorically for certain is because I don't have Elswick sale catalogues for late 1911, early 1912. I got one for 1909 as well as the 1913 one but there is a bit of a gap in between in fact just like Alvarius, this is a lie um, I just remembered I did in fact have a couple of them so I went and had a quick look and the Elzik manuals for 1911 and 1912 stop at the 12 inch gun but they also contain the mysterious line larger guns are under construction or have been constructed but the details are withheld from publication which, considering that in the 1913 variant, they have advertised 13.5, which obviously was being used in Royal Navy Super Dreadnoughts at the time, and actually even before 1913, and the 16-inch just got, kind of just goes out and pops into existence um, all of a sudden, one suspects that it was around. So yeah, I think whoever was building the 16-inch gun at Elzik, if they'd used a 14-inch gun in the Orions, King George V's, and Iron Dukes would have got a very interesting call from somebody in the Admiralty. But if they'd had 16-inch weapons, 16-inch 45 caliber weapons at Jutland, well, you still would have had the um, shell fusing issues, but a 16-inch 45 caliber gun with that kind of shell would be even harder hitting than the 15-inch 42. So possibly some ships that historically did make it back, like the Seidlitz, might not. Von Hindenburg asks, how long was the period during which ships at sea around the world could r hear radio transmissions from large land-based radios but could not reliably reply in turn? Were there ever instances of ships receiving orders via radio and replying via a local telegraph office or some such? It was a surprisingly long period. I mean, you've got to understand, obviously, radio transmissions in terms of any kind of long distance radio was a fairly recent innovation you know a Marconi system and all of that lot but for a for, for a very long time and I suppose technically to an extent if they were forced to rely purely on radio even today a ship can always hear radio transmissions being made at a considerably longer distance than it can necessarily reply to them because of course most of the time, a ship doesn't have the same kind of power and antenna to transmit radio transmissions as a dedicated high-power radio ground station does. These days, obviously, they can use satellite phones and all sorts of things, and the effective range of transmissions, especially using satellite relays, is effectively across the globe. But in terms of pure radio communications, as you would have in World War One and even to an extent in World War Two. um the ship's radios did have a limited range. By World War II, with so many ships around and um, communications relay ships and so forth, it wasn't too much of a problem. Um, but certainly in World War I, outside of the North Sea, there would be many cases where a shore station could broadcast out into, say, the Atlantic or the Pacific, and a receiving ship might be able to hear it perfectly well, but there was nothing they could do to reply about to it. Um, at which point you either have to sail closer to the land and send, then send your reply, or in some cases go via, uh, as you mentioned, a telegraph station. 
by World War One, you could just receive and transmit radio at a few hundred miles using shipboard radios. But due to interception and encryption um, and decryption efforts and, you know, direction finding, etc., ships at long, long distance patrols tended to sometimes prefer to duck in to receive um, orders and send messages via the telegraph, which was a lot more secure. Um, so you see this happening with both for both sides, actually, during the initial pursuit of Graf Bay and his East Asia squadron down the up and down the western side of the South American continent, for example. But broadly speaking, by the time you get into the interwar period, radios and coverage of stations has improved to the de- to a degree such that realistically there's not too many areas out of reach as long as you don't mind actually making a radio transmission in the first place. Craig Woodward asks, two mine-related questions. Do you think it would have been more impactful if Gunther Preen had laid a bunch of mines at random points of scapa flow rather than torpedoing the Royal Oak? And rather than the ineffective bombing raids on the Atlantic U-boat pens, would the RAF have done better to drop mines in the entrances to the port in a long-term campaign? Um, I don't really think U-47 would have done that much benefit if it had been a mine-laying U-boat instead, mainly for the reason that the British were well aware of the German propensity to drop aerial mines. And given that although Luftwaffe 5 hadn't moved into Norway yet, the Germans had already demonstrated with Junkers 88 attacks that they could reach Scapa Flow, and therefore the Royal Navy was conducting regular mine-sweeping patrols around the harbour in order to you know, guard against any potential mines that German aircraft might have laid. And so I suspect any kind of... Um, attempt by U-47 to lay mines would have, I mean, it, yeah, they infiltrated, it would have been successful, but they probably would have then been found and gotten rid of in relatively short order by Royal Navy minesweepers. So, I mean, it's possible one or two mines might have gone undetected long enough to, for something to hit them, but overall probably would have done a lot less damage than the sinking of Royal Oak did. That was somewhat more direct. And as far as dropping mines in front of the U-boat pens, again, the RAF did try and do this as well as the bombing campaign, but equally, the Kriegsmarine was aware of what the Royal Royal Air Force was doing, and so they also did fairly regular mine-sweeping passages up across the outgoing and incoming routes for U-boats off of the French ports. So it it was done, um, given that up until the invention of the Tall Boys, the bombing raids against the U-boat pens themselves didn't really accomplish that much. You probably could make an argument that just switching those missions over to dropping mines might have had a, a slightly greater effect, if, even if it was nothing other than making the German minesweepers run themselves into the ground a bit more. But that was something that was already being done. It wasn't kind of an either-or thing. Chief Eyeroll asks, Can you tell us your opinion of Admiral Bing's court-martial and, separately, the punishment? What do you think of Admiral Lord Anson's actions during the events? Uh, yes, it's it's an incredibly difficult one for me because there is a lot of blame to be assigned that doesn't rest with Bing for the events that led up to his court-martial, but there are also a couple of things which very definitely are um, to blame, uh, which where the blame rests with Bing. Whether or not that's in in and of itself worthy of being executed is a separate matter which we'll discuss in a moment but briefly for those of you unaware Bing was sent to relieve Menorca which was under threat at the time it was British owned the French were threatening to take it and in fact they ended up actually taking it Um, now Bing was assigned an undersized understrength undermanned and frankly poorly supported applied and poorly repaired fleet to do the job so he was not given the right tools for the job by any way stretch of the imagination and in many ways he was actually hampered by the admiralty office who were messing around with other things while expecting him expecting him to treat it as a priority but not actually giving him the resources to do so so he was almost being set up for failure right from the beginning and then 
he wasn't given much cooperation on his way down to Menorca. Once he actually en engaged the French squadron that was just off of Menorca in battle, it didn't go particularly well. A lot of that can be laid on the actions of a lot of that blame could be laid on the actions of individual captains. Bing himself does seem to have tried to prosecute the battle quite aggressively uh, and with some reasonably good tactics, but was let down by his subordinates. I suppose the flip side you could say to that is that he had plenty of time to talk to his subordinates on the way from England all the way around into the Mediterranean, so that the fact that he had an idea, a good idea of what to do but his captains executed it poorly can is partly on them partly also on him for not you know bringing them up to speed and getting them in shape on the way so a, a lot of that at that point is mostly not bing's direct fault or his fault at all where he is very definitely a fault is in the aftermath of the battle okay he didn't have as much as many troops as he'd liked but he did have a reasonable number of troops that he could have landed at Menorca to strengthen the garrison. Maybe it would have worked, maybe it wouldn't, who knows, but he didn't even try. Uh, didn't even bother talking to the garrison at Menorca. That very definitely is his own failure. And then he decided to go back to Gibraltar to repair, reprovision, and maybe scrounge up some more troops. And by the time he'd finished that, it was too late. Menorca had fallen to the French, and everyone obviously was in thoroughly displeased. He got recalled back to the UK, and then he was taken for trial. So, a little bit of blame to go all around there. Um, a lot of it not Bing's fault, but a pretty major failing there at the end by Bing. Now, the punishment, unfortunately, the because of previous, shall we say, lack of full effort by various British officers, the Articles of War had been revised so that if you were convicted of not doing your utmost against the enemy, you would be sentenced to death. There was no alternative. There would be an alternative a couple of decades later, but not at the time. It was literally basically do your utmost to engage the enemy or else we will shoot you if you are court-martialed. And so when Bing was brought to trial... Um, there was only ever going to be one outcome if he was found guilty. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the problems that weren't his fault, that I just outlined, were attributed to him, which helped sway the verdict. But at the same time, if you're reading things even just purely legalistically, the fact that he was supposed to do his utmost to fulfil his mission, that was his, his sworn duty. And in failing to contact or relieve the garrison he had failed to do that he was technically guilty of not doing his utmost in the face of the enemy so legally the death sentence by the law of the time was justified whether or not it was actually justified is a completely different matter i don't think it was um and i mean that's why there was the revision later on because people began to realize you know there are degrees of not doing your utmost against against an enemy some of which may be well be court martialable court and punishable by death by the standards of the time, but others like this probably weren't. Um, so, yeah, his punishment was legal uh, and according to the law code, I, but I don't think it was just. And the, the thing was, pretty much everybody who passed the sentence passed the sentence purely because that was the only option on the book. Um, a bunch of people then tried to, including people who had been on the, the judging panel, tried to get a clemency or a pardon for him. But at this point in time, uh, the King of England was still very much involved in the running of the government, um, a lot more than the monarchy is today. And the government of the day had made quite the enemy of the king. So when the government came asking for favours, the king wasn't particularly willing to listen, period, let alone consider the exact merits of the case. And the general public was very, very angry about the loss of Menorca. And so without a royal reprieve, there was no choice but to shoot Bing, which he was um, on the deck of HMS Monarch. Um, the, the main thing... It's a bit weird because whilst 
his execution was almost certainly unjust. In fact, pretty much unjust, even as I, even people at the time thought it was unjust and uh, basically an artifact of a, a bit of legalism. In other ways, if you want to look for the silver lining on a very big cloud, it possibly did have a overall beneficial effect because whilst Voltaire obviously did make a bit of a satire of it, there was a rather significant uptick thereafter. Um, British officers who sometimes before this had been very aggressive, sometimes had been sensible and sometimes had frankly been somewhat cowardly and spiteful. Once it was clear that even if you were an admiral, if you didn't do absolutely everything in your power to destroy the enemy, you could and would be shot... This had something of a galvanizing effect on the rest of the officers, which led to um, a very, very aggressive bunch of Royal Navy captains who would, and, and admirals, who would generally do their level best to destroy their enemies at every turn, which in turn had a bit of a morale boosting effect in the British Navy overall and a significant morale downturn in um, the enemy navies because they then knew pretty quickly that if you saw a British ship on the horizon and it realised you are an enemy, they were going to attack you, um, whether you liked it or not, whether it was even sane or not, um, except in the absolute worst outlier cases, like, say, a brig coming across a ship of the line. And that probably helped the Royal Navy quite a bit in the subsequent years. So whilst the shooting of Bing was not moral or justified it may well have helped save a lot more lives than it cost in the long term, which is a very weird position to be in. And finally for this week's Salty Viking 10,022 asks, if naval aviation had proved itself a lot more in World War I, would that affect the opinion on carriers at all? And would the London and Washington naval treaties have limited carriers more heavily as a result? Yes, I think to a fair degree. The, the single biggest way that this probably could have happened would have been either if the war had continued into 1919 or if Sopwith Cuckoo production had been a bit faster than it was historically, which either way basically means large numbers of Sopwith Cuckoos are employed in a attack on the high seas fleet in at the end of World War One and Wilhelmshaven. Now, assuming that went anywhere near as successfully as my initial wargaming of it seems to indicate it could have done um and bearing in mind it is obviously a highly variable thing because we're talking about world war one technology um a video on that at some point later this year anyway if that had been the case it would have been a carrier launched attack and if it caused significant damage then yeah it would have basically written the final notice on can carriers cause significant damage to Battle fleets answer yes. Um, there still would have been a degree of argument as to whether it could cause damage to fleets at anchor, uh, fl sorry, to fleets at sea as opposed to fleets at anchor, and whether or not having your own carriers, fighter cover, anti-aircraft guns, etc., would mitigate that. But instead of starting the argument from the basis of aircraft can't hurt ships, maybe they can. It would have been aircraft can hurt ships. And maybe we can stop that. So that would have made carriers a lot more important um, going forward. But I don't think that the Washington and London treaties would have limited them much more heavily. Because well, when you look at the, the tonnage limits on carriers were overall and per ship always less than battleships anyway. With the carve out exceptions for Lexington, Saratoga, Akagi and Carga. So winding them in even further is not really all that likely. But, in, I mean, to be honest, in fact, any, if anything, if the carriers are seen to be somewhat more useful than they historically were thought of in a good part of the interwar period, the navies in question might actually press for higher limits on carriers. If carriers go from being a useful scouting and strike in harbour accessory to actually this could be a significant portion of our battle line tactics you might actually see some navies pressing for parity or at least maybe two-thirds 
strength of carriers versus battleships and or possibly can you know at least carrier individual displacement being capped at the same as battleships with possibly also greater numbers so yeah if anything a successful use of carriers at the end of world war one might well have instigated more and bigger carriers in the interwar period not smaller and fewer of them and that's it for this week thank you very much for listening no particular channel admin to discuss this time around other than to say that i will be uploading the rest of my spare book collection uh, to the website at some point in the next week or so so look out for that i might put a community post up about it um since <laughs> apparently you guys like buying my spare books so Huzzah! It works for everybody. Anyway, see you next time.